Hello everyone, this is Bob and Threadbear, and today I'm going to discuss one of the most important things you can do to make your setting unique. That thing is to create a completely new culture. A culture that isn't just the one you live in right now, or generic medieval fantasy realm, or generic America, but now we're in space. A strange and interesting culture will set your setting apart, make it memorable in a way that sticks in the brain, thanks to the way that humans unconsciously pick up and memorize social cues. Now, a lot of authors and setting creators avoid doing this. Partly it's because a protagonist from a different culture is often harder to relate to, but mostly I think it's because creating a new culture from scratch sounds like a lot of hard work. So the first thing I'm going to do is teach you how to cheat. Real Life Mix and Match There are hundreds, if not thousands, of cultures in the world today. Even more cultures have existed in previous times and places. Medieval England was a very different place to live in than Renaissance England, or Victorian England, or present-day England. China today hardly has anything in common with China of the original Han Dynasty. Geographically, Germany, France, and Italy are very close together, but each nation has gone off in a different direction culturally. Then there are regions within large nations that have their own cultures and accents. And you also have subcultures, generational differences, population migrations, fads, fan bases, and on and on and on. Here's the point. You don't need to create a new culture from scratch. In fact, you shouldn't. That's not how imagination works. Imagination works by combining old information like memories, facts, and skills and assembling them in a new order. Think of it like a tangram. Each tangram has only seven simple shapes, but depending on how you manipulate them, you can make hundreds of different patterns. That's what you need to do to create a new culture. Take pieces of current or historical cultures and mix them all together to end up with something completely new. Imagine a city with the architecture and fog of Victorian London, and then add the outdoor bazaars of Muslim Africa, the fashion sense of Renaissance Italy, the cultural mores of warring states Japan, and the precarious politics of late Imperial Rome. Each piece comes from a time and place on Earth, but once you put them together, you'll have a society that this planet has never seen. But. That being said, you shouldn't just pull cultural pieces out at random and then stick them together just assuming that they'll fit. A lot of outside factors can have an effect on culture, and by focusing on each one of them in turn, you can break the problem down into bite-sized pieces and then figure out which pieces of which cultures will work best in the setting you're building. Climate and Terrain the people who lived in the steppes of Central Asia have been nomadic or semi-nomadic for most of their history. And this is because it was easier to move around, but hard to grow important crops like wheat, barley, or rice. Many of the tribes of the Amazon River Basin and the islands of Indonesia have been culturally isolated because the thick jungles they live in isolate them physically from their neighbors. The Polynesians developed a sophisticated seafaring culture despite having no written language because they lived on a series of small islands that you can only reach with sturdy ocean-going vessels and a deep understanding of currents and winds. Climate and terrain have a big impact on the local culture because they set priorities that the culture in question cannot afford to ignore. The Japanese eat a lot of fish because they live on a series of islands. China grows a lot of rice because rice was first domesticated in China. Large-scale invasions and migrations like the Indo-Europeans, the Huns, the Mongols, and the Vikings usually take place after a period of fertility that boosts the local population. The climates and terrains you use in your setting should always be major factors when deciding what kinds of cultures to borrow from. Another way that climate and terrain change culture is with the timing and nature of annual holidays. Winter's end holidays, harvest holidays, solstice and equinox holidays. Cultures around the world have a variety of ways to mark these special occasions. Even the modern American holidays have a connection to the seasons, like how Memorial Day is the unofficial start of summer, while Labor Day is the unofficial start of fall. Even Independence Day doubles as a midsummer festival. But different regions experience different seasons, like the wet and dry seasons of tropical countries. The way people celebrate their holidays changes based on the weather and the time of year, so keep that in mind when you consider adding holidays. 
Of course, you should also think about the impact of climates and terrains that exist in your setting, but don't exist in real life. If everyone lives on floating islands and flying ships, they might have a taboo against throwing someone over the side, since it's such a terrible and easy way to die. If humans are colonizing new planets, and spaceships can travel faster than light, but communications can't, then there might be a whole industry dedicated to ferrying messages back and forth between star systems. And people living on distant colonies may be isolated from everywhere else by days, weeks, or even months of travel. Historical and Political Events In the English colonies of North America, a group of settlers bribed a sea captain so that they could found a new settlement instead of heading to Boston as planned. They called their new town Plymouth, and after a good harvest in 1621, they celebrated a day of Thanksgiving and invited the local Native American tribe, who had helped them survive the previous winter. Thanksgiving celebrations in general predate 1621, but this specific event has become the theme of the modern holiday. In 27 BCE, Gaius Octavius, later called Caesar Augustus, won a civil war in Rome and forever changed that nation's political landscape. This change would put political power in the hands of the military instead of the citizens, and the culture of Rome would change since the pathway to power was now to become a general rather than a senator. Historical and political events can have a massive impact on the culture of future generations, including events that don't seem that important in the moment. At the time that Jesus of Nazareth died, he was just one more provincial prophet stirring up a ruckus in a conquered country. But his legacy is a hell of a lot bigger than that today. So when you're coming up with the history of your setting, try to think of a few analogies to real-life events, and consider what effect they had on the cultures that followed. Physiology and Magic On Earth, all humans are extremely similar to each other and any child could adapt fairly well to any culture, no matter what their genetic history happens to be. However, fantasy and science fiction works often involve intelligent creatures whose physiology has little to nothing in common with humans. These differences can have a big impact on how these creatures understand the world and how they deal with each other. They could not adapt to a human culture, no matter how hard they tried, and vice versa. For instance, elves that can live for hundreds of years are often portrayed as perfectionists who like to take their time with a project because they have plenty of time to spare. An alien species that sees a different spectrum of light might appear to wear plain white clothes or maybe garish clashing colors, but to their eyes, their clothes are just as colorful and fashionable as what humans wear. Another way that fantasy settings in particular diverge from the real world is in the fact that magic is real and provable. That means, as the setting's creator, you have to ask yourself how common magic is, how many people know it's real, and whether superstitions are fake or real. You also have to ask whether magic makes life easier for people the way technology does. If magic is reliable and relatively easy to use, then a magical society may resemble a modern or early modern society, rather than the traditional medieval culture. On the other hand, if magic is risky, then it might be taboo or illegal instead. Or maybe magic could be the main method of gaining power, and that would have an effect on the way high society functions. The ability to use magic could be hereditary, random, or open to everyone, and each of these options would also have an effect on society. Technology Technology has a massive impact on society and culture. The spread of the printing press in Europe led directly to the Protestant Reformation since the Catholic Church no longer had a monopoly on Bibles. The growth of factory jobs turned rural nations into urban nations, and the loss of factory jobs to automation has led to a more service and content-based society. Advances in technology can cause a society to change radically almost overnight, and a lack of advancement can cause a culture to stagnate and stay largely the same for decades or even centuries. During the Edo period of Japan, the shogunate isolated the islands from outside contact and technology so that they could solidify their rule, and in the process, Japanese culture remained largely the same for 250 years. Now, with many science fiction settings, you don't need me to tell you that technology affects culture. 
For a lot of stories and settings, the whole point is to analyze and theorize about what changes a new technology might have on culture. But this is also a question you should ask when it comes to fantasy settings. Medieval Europe refers to hundreds of nations and cultures spread across a thousand years of history, and during that time there were all kinds of advances like crossbows, cannons, ocean-going ships, cathedrals, musical instruments, algebra, the number zero, and the magnetic compass. All of these technologies changed the way people lived and worked and fought. So do yourself a favor and pay attention to the time period when you're deciding on which cultures to steal from. Religion Culturally speaking, religion has a rather interesting role to play. Religions tend to cover larger regions than individual cultures and nations, and so they give neighboring cultures a common set of holidays and rituals and social mores, even if they don't share a common language. By creating religions for your setting, you can organize individual cultures and nations into groups, and then make generalizations about those cultures because those common elements are rooted in religious traditions. Now, religion tends to be less important in present-day and science fiction settings, but it's important to note that you can do something similar with philosophy and ideologies. Ultimately, religion exists to answer two questions that every child asks. What is the best way to live my life, and what happens when I die? Philosophy and ideology can answer those questions, or at least tell you how to ask them even if they aren't technically a religion. And so you can use ideology in place of religion when you want to group various cultures together. Language barriers. Language barriers don't often come up in fictional works, mostly because it causes a lot of problems with communication, and communication is the whole point when you're writing something that you want someone else to read. Still, this difficulty is why I'm bringing it up. A language barrier is hard to cross, and so cultural cues and identities tend to end when they hit a language barrier. If communication is hard, cultures will tend to be very different. If communication is easy, cultures will converge as people share ideas and empathize with one another. If you want two radically different cultures to sit right next to each other in the same basic climate, put a language barrier between them. The Four Major Milestones Every culture on Earth honors four important milestones in every person's life. Birth, coming of age, marriage, and death. Not every culture holds formal ceremonies for every milestone, but everyone acknowledges them. Even in a secular nation, these moments are important and legally recognized. These ceremonies or recognitions also tend to be dramatic, which means there's a good chance that they'll come up in whatever story you write. That gives you a great opportunity to make your culture distinct, so consider what your setting's culture or cultures do to mark the four major milestones. Maybe they bury their dead and then host a big party, like the Irish. Maybe the soil is too rocky for burial, and so they cremate the dead and scatter the ashes into the sea during a solemn ceremony. Maybe it's a future culture that fires their dead into the sun, there to become one with the source of life. If you do nothing else to make your setting's culture unique, you should at least come up with something for the four milestones. Minor Gestures In some cultures, it's rude to leave food on the plate because it means you didn't want to eat everything the cook gave you. In other cultures, it's rude to clean your plate because it means the cook didn't give you enough food. In some cultures, making a circle with your finger and thumb is an affirmation, and in other cultures, it's a rude gesture. In some cultures, you start counting with your index finger, and in other cultures, you start counting with your thumb. Every culture has ways to be rude and ways to be polite, mostly because people need ways to express that they want to be rude or polite. Minor gestures in social conventions like these are another good tool for differentiating cultures because they come up during everyday activities and conversations, which means they will definitely come up during your story. You can show that a culture is different just by reversing the name order, for instance, or by having one culture always use honorifics like Mr. and Mrs., while the neighbors always use first names exclusively. You can also make an alien species truly alien by having them frown when they're happy, 
or shrug when they're surprised. Minor details like these can be annoying to keep straight, but they are great for driving home the idea that your setting's culture is different. Fashion Fashion has a close connection to climate and technology. Because climate determines what kind of clothes you can or should wear outside, while advancing technology offers an increasingly wider array of colors, styles, materials, and accessories. Most medieval peasants wore simple clothing because that was all they had, while today we have synthetic fabrics, bright artificial dyes, scientifically designed winter clothing, and high fashion designs that appear to defy physics. However, fashion also follows social conventions. In Western countries, it's traditional for men to wear pants and women to wear skirts and dresses, and this is mostly because of historical fashion trends rather than historical practicalities. It's also traditional for American judges to dress up in dark robes, even though they could technically go to work wearing anything and do their job just as well. Another point about fashion is the way that cultures use colors. Black is the traditional color of death in Europe, but white is the color of death in China and India. At various times and places, the color red has meant courage, sacrifice, luck, happiness, love, anger, danger, and sex. Colors can have several meanings within the same culture, but my main point is that you can have your characters use the meaning of colors to make statements with how they dress. And you can make their culture feel exotic by having that color mean something unusual. Thanks for joining me again for today's journey into weaving worlds. Please like, share, and subscribe because that raises my visibility here on YouTube. Check out my other stuff if you have some time, support me on Patreon if you have some money, and I hope I'll see you again for the next video.